We are so excited to be working with Strivectin again. You know we're big fans of this brand because they do the work. All their science-backed skincare is vetted by independent clinical testing, which you know is music to my ears. And Strivectin just came out with a new acne control line called the Multi-Action Clear Collection. This is a three-step routine that delivers powerful results without disrupting the skin's barrier or drying out skin. Okay, listen, I've been writing about and recommending acne products for years, and that's really hard to do. It includes Strivectin's Gentle Daily Clarifying Cleanser that won't leave skin tight or dry, the Daily Brightening and Retexturizing Toner that helps to visibly fade discoloration, and the Acne Clearing Treatment Lotion, which reduces breakouts and helps prevent future breakouts from forming. Best of all, the Strivectin Multi-Action Clear Collection has amazing clinical results. It's been shown to improve acne blemishes and post-blemish marks in seven days. You know we love a multi-purpose product, and the fact that this collection does all that and helps visibly fade the ghosts of pimple past without drying your skin makes it clear winner. Visit strivectin.com to learn more about their new multi-action clear collection of products. Subscribe to emails, and you'll even get 15% off your first order. That's strivectin, S-T-R-I-V-E-C-T-I-N.com. Hey everyone, we are so excited to talk about our sponsor, Color Guru. You know how much we love getting our colors done, finding out our seasonal type. Jess and I have both done Color Guru's analysis. And now we have some good news. You are going to be eligible for your own free Color Guru analysis. So when you get a Color Guru analysis, a color guru will analyze your hair, skin, and eye color and match you with your perfect color palette for clothing. Your color guru will give you a 15-page color radiance report plus a digital color card for your phone, so handy, and a laminated color card for your purse. P.S. I also hang mine in my closet. I have my color guru card at my desk so I can refer <sighs> to it. So handy for online shopping. Simply match the clothes in the store to the colors on your card and feel confident that you're choosing a perfect color for you. Okay, does that sound amazing? I know it does. Are you ready? Five Fat Mascara listeners are going to win a free color guru analysis. Here's how you enter. Go over to Instagram, follow Fat Mascara, and follow Color Guru. They're at Your Color Guru, at Your Color Guru. Follow us both. We will have an Instagram post there all about the giveaway. You comment on it. All you have to do is comment what you think your seasonal type is. Are you right? Are you wrong? You won't know until you win. And five of you will. You're going to win a free Color Guru analysis, $165 value. Again, just go over to Instagram, follow Fat Mascara and Your Color Guru. Leave a comment on the giveaway post for your chance to win. Hey everyone, it's interview day. I am so psyched to be here with you. I'm here. My name's Jessica. And my name's Jennifer. Welcome to Fat Mascara Beauty Podcast. You're psyched to be here, but you're not here the whole show. You're just here for the intro. I know, but I'm listening along in real time with our fabulous audience. So if you're here, if you land on Fat Mascara, you probably know what you're in for. An amazing interview with a woman perfumer who does more than just create beautiful, fine fragrances. I mean, Jen, set us up. Oh yeah. Dana Schmidt. She's a perfumer at Givadon. I thought it was really cool. I wanted to talk to her because she does do fine fragrances. Like she did guest seductive flirt. She's done those scents that, you know, spray and are beautiful, but she also makes candle fragrances Mm. and body lotion fragrances. And two of my favorite candle brands, she's the perfumer for some of their scents, Boy Smells and Otherland. She's Mm -hmm. created fragrances for their candles. So she's worked at Givadon most of her career. She started out as an experimental chemist. She was one of three people selected from about a thousand applicants, no big deal, to study at Givadon's perfumery school. That's where she got her training not that long ago. Yeah, a little bit. Well, you'll hear about that in the interview. But you'll get to know Dana. We'll talk about perfume. I just love, love having a fragrance expert on Fat Mascara. And I know you guys too as well because you always you always ask for them. So mm-hmm. not only do we have a perfumer, we have a female perfumer, which is pretty badass. Let's get into it. Dana Schmidt, welcome to Fat Mascara. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So I want to talk about your job. And I know sometimes you you just told me sometimes you don't like talking about your job. First of all, why? You have the coolest job. Okay. I love my job. I like talking about it in general, but sometimes I do find it can be awkward because I mean, specifically, I remember I was at 
a very small event, either like a birthday party or like an elopement party. You know what I mean? Like where the focus mm-hmm. should have been on someone else. And it, somehow my job came up and everybody got to talking about my job. And I just felt so bad that like I was taking away the moment Spotlight. for, yeah. Whoever, whoever well, was there. your job as a perfumer, yes. If someone tells you they're a perfumer, I mean, you want to know more. What yes. do you What do you do? Do you tell people you're a perfumer? So, like, if it's somebody you know next to me on the airplane, no way, <laughs> because I do not want to talk to them and entertain their questions. So, I have learned. I mean, I got a tip from a coworker where you just say, "I work at a chemical company." And then, which is not a lie. Yeah, it's not a lie. It's it is the truth. I guess that the fewer follow up questions there. Exactly, it really shuts down the conversation. But you are a chemist. It's not. It's not a lie. You're an artist and a chemist. It's like a very cool job. So, how did you even get into this? Did you study chemistry first, art first? Where did Where did you get your background knowledge? Yeah, so I did actually study chemistry. The those are the true traditional backgrounds: is either chemistry or art. Although personally, I say you don't have to have done either, but it just happens. I was a chem major because I really loved it. I like sort of the puzzle aspect of organic chemistry, thinking about how to make new molecules. And I was studying really hard. And because of that, I kind of had to let go of my artistic hobbies. Like I loved music, but I wasn't able to be playing any instruments or anything like that at the time. I loved painting and I didn't have any time to take any painting classes. So I was really 100% focused on chemistry. And then I happened to be visiting a friend studying abroad in Paris. And there is this museum there called the Perfume Museum. And I just thought, oh, that's amazing. How French, how cool. I love perfume, so I'm going to go. And it was there that they talked about how being a perfumer is this unique blend of chemistry and art. And it was like exactly what I had been missing and thought that, okay, I know chemistry, I know I'm artistic, but do I have a good sense of smell? I don't know. So it was kind of the spark that led me down this path. And luckily it all worked out, you know, 10 years later. Now, how'd you find out you have a good sense of smell? Did you have to take some, some tests? I did. Um, To get into the perfumery school, you have to take a smell test. So that's kind of the moment. I kind of had this like weird inkling. I had always been fascinated, like growing up, my favorite store at the mall was Bath and Body Works. And I would drag my best friend in there and smell like everything. And she hated me for it. Wait, now what era of Bath and Body Works are we talking? Like a plumeria? Are we going further back to like a gingham days? Cucumber melon and sweet pea. Cucumber melon. It's a classic. Yes. Yes, yes it is. So I had always been interested like both in products, but even my dad is like a home chef. That's his big hobby is cooking and he even has a garden and everything. So I was always exposed to fresh herbs and amazing home cooked meals and I helped him with all that too. So I was always like smelling things and thinking about smells that other people weren't necessarily. So yeah, I didn't know if I had a good sense of smell, but as soon as I sort of discovered the industry, which is completely unknown to Americans, but very well known in France, it was like, oh yeah, I guess I might be able to do that. But to your point, it wasn't confirmed until I actually could take a true smell test. And you went to perfumery school in France, I imagine. Yes, in France with Givadon. Givadon has an internal perfumery school where we train our perfumers. I just have to know now, do you also have to know French? You don't. I took French growing up. I mean, that was like, hence visiting my friend in France and all that. But you don't actually have to know French. It's really independent study because there are only like one or two people who get into the school every year. So you're not, there's no classes. It's sort of you working with the director and them guiding you as you discover the raw materials, learn how to make accords. And like my rose accord is different than every other student's rose accord. So Mm -hmm. there's no set rules. It's all about learning and discovering for yourself. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure your chemistry background 
sort of served you well there, didn't it? It definitely did because we do use a lot of molecules in perfumery. And so just to sort of have a basic idea of this is phenyl ethyl alcohol and this is what it means and this is its shape and it's similar to other things. It it even just helps you like memorize everything because they're not completely foreign words to you. So I worked in a organofluorine lab where we made carbon fluorine bonds. Like I could get really nerdy on chemistry, but when you're an organic chemist, you're making new bonds and perfumery is not about doing chemistry like that. So right. for me, they are very different disciplines where, where yes, I, I have this background of understanding the molecules, but like, I wouldn't say what I do is quote unquote chemistry. Right. You're working with a library of molecules that are already created. And now you just have to remember which one you want for which project. Exactly. How do you, how do you keep that skill set sharp? Like, are you like, how many, like if I said a number, like how many molecules do you think you know the smell of like right now, if somebody were to quiz you? So it's debatable. At the school, we learn 500 and you have to know them blind. Like somebody hands you a little solution and you... Do you think if you smelled all 500, you could still remember them all? I could get close. Let's put it that way. (laughs) I will say because it's not hard to distinguish between an orange and a patchouli, right? But to distinguish between different qualities of oranges, an orange, a lemon, a grapefruit, completely blind, especially those types of things we all have a basic relationship with. You probably wouldn't really forget even between those. But once you get down to the molecules, sometimes you're distinguishing between things that have just like one bond difference are different isomers that are really structurally very, very close and smell close. So that's why I say I could get close because I'm sure like I would be able to say, okay, this is a pineapple note. So it's probably in this class of of molecules. Do you have, this is so random, but I'm thinking about like the mnemonics I still use to this day as my job. For example, fuchsia, the color, Mm -hmm. impossible to spell. Like, I don't know why I could never spell it. So it's fuchsia in my head. Sorry, everyone. It just is. F-U-C-H-S-I-A. Do you remember any of the like mnemonics you would use to be like, oh, that damn phenol that I can never remember. Here's, or like just any molecule that you, you had to learn. I don't think I really had that issue, to be honest, just because, as you said, my chemistry background, I like they those molecules already had meaning to me. I know there were people at the school who didn't come from a chemistry background. And they said that was one of the real like hard parts was that the names were meaningless to them. (laughs) So they were memorizing both the smell and the names at the same time. And are some of these, I'm getting so nerdy here, but whatever, are some of these like natural extracts and essences that wouldn't, that are like a many molecules in them, but that you had to know the smell of, or is it just like straight up pure one molecule at a time? So the way that it works is you start smelling with the naturals. Typically, well, not all, but again, the naturals are ten, tend to be things that we have a relationship al- with already, like a lemon, a rose, a rosemary, basil all these types of things. So sometimes they're foreign. Like I had never smelled Davana, I don't think, until I got to the school. What's Davana? It is technically a flower, but we put it in the fruity category and it smells a lot like a cranberry to me. As you said, because they're more complex, you probably will be able to recognize them a little easier. There's more to like Mm. latch on to. So once you get through the naturals, then you move on to the synthetics and that is where the the challenge begins. Right. This is like ambroxan and not like gain laundry detergent. Well, it's better than that. We had to learn three different qualities of ambroxan and the only difference. I just are pulled like a the, random molecule out of my head. The I'm impurities. Sorry. I, no, but that's a good example. What does had, ambroxan smell like? Actually, I don't know. To me, it's very salty, fresh, airy. We categorize it as an amber and it sort of is a piece of what makes the complex natural smell of ambergris. Talk to me for a second about ambers, which have always confused me because in my world, amber is tree sap that's fossilized. How does that, are the, are the smells of that, the amber, cat? what is the amber category? So, okay. We have amber, which can be used to describe strong woody notes. 
And we also have amber to describe sort of a perfume accord that would be like a Shalimar type of fragrance, which is a lot of vanilla resins like the ambers that you're talking about from tree sap. Some we have some resins that are sort of from saps. Dana didn't know she was coming on a quiz show. Guys. I know. I really didn't. Because there's like, one more thing. I feel like I'm back in school. <laughs> no, there's definitely one more thing that I should include for making an amber. In that amber category with the vanilla and the resins. Or maybe some woody notes. Yeah. Like I forget yeah. if technically it's like patchouli or something else. So it's both a family and then like a subcategory of a type of scent like the ambroxan that you were just talking about. That's confusing. I know. It is confusing. Awesome. So we can start with ambergris. And ambroxan was a molecule that was isolated and found in ambergris. So that's sort of where that naming comes along. Mm, mm -hmm. And then it was such an amazing molecule and trend that the big companies started pursuing more molecules that were similar, but always stronger, stronger, stronger. Because if people like something, they want more of it. And... Ambroxan is quite an expensive and the, molecule. And the whale puke wasn't cutting it for them. No, well, enough. that's, you know, we can't even source that. I know that. they don't use that anymore. Yeah, but no. can you tell people what ambergris smells like or ambergris? Okay, so it is whale vomit, let's say. They don't actually know how it comes out of the whale. But it's basically the whale, after they've swallowed all of this exoskeletons from the the squid and stuff, it gets like stuck mm. in their stomach and it creates kind of like a fur ball. And so they barf up all of this stuff that they can't digest. And it floats on the top of the ocean. It bakes in the sun. So it's like this mixture of this animalic smell, we would say, which can be quite like fecal, plus that ocean saltiness and baked in the sun. And it sounds disgusting, but somehow it's an amazing fixative. Like, I think it's quite, you know, you get this like visceral feeling of seduction, maybe. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it used to be used widely in fragrances, but because there's no way to recreate that process, it is impossible to source. So like if I made the next Jador and I wanted to use ambergris in it, there would not be enough in the world to right. guarantee that year after year we'd have a supply. Or that it would smell the same. What if you got this whale over here in South Pacific and this whale up here, like a, the consistency? Exactly. So we made, so humans made these molecules. Ambroxan is Ambroxan, one of them too. Yeah. Is that a smell that has that kind of vibe? So it has like that salty, watery freshness piece to it. Mm, mm -hmm. It doesn't have the more animalic. Yeah, there's there's a lot um, a lot of molecules in the ambergris, and so ambroxan is just one of them, and it's what they isolated and found to be one of the things that had the amazing fixative properties and gave it that like fresh saltwater feeling as well as complexity and like an oomph and staying power. You mentioned for you, and maybe this was your mnemonic. I don't know. There's a seduction visceral quality to it. So that makes me think about your personal preferences, like, which is what smell is all about, right? Like, how do you separate those from your work or don't you? So I think it's easy in a way because I'm actually such a people pleaser that if somebody is telling me they want something, you know, whether or not it's something that I would buy for myself, it doesn't really matter. I want to make them happy. So yeah, for me, it's easy to sort of set that aside my personal preferences at the same time like i'm sure subliminally i am human i my preferences have made up the perfumer that i am today so i'm still going to turn to things that i like to use in order to give them something whether or not it's something that i would want personally yeah well if this person comes to you or this company and they're like we want a seductive fragrance and like perfumer a is going to reach for rose i don't know maybe some people that's seductive and here you are reaching for whale vomit, salty, like animalic, that's also sort of a preference or a feeling or emotional history you have. Does that help you in your work or is that 
sometimes like you go off track because you you guys aren't speaking the same language when you're talking to someone who's like a client of Givadon who wants to create a new fragrance. Yeah, I wouldn't call that off track. I would call that like mismatched, you know, because the client is going to come and ask for, if they're very specific, like I want a rose and I consider a rose to be seductive, then I would give them a rose. But if they're going to leave it super open because either they don't know or they just want to see and they want to keep it open, one person's going to give them a jasmine, one person's going to give them a vanilla, and they're going to take it from there, right? I was just thinking about the people that we've had on this podcast that work in fragrance, and we've had more than a couple of people. We've had some perfumers, but more so we've also had fragrance creators, or they call themselves fragrance designers or creative directors that sometimes work at a brand and then hire people like you to create their perfumes. What's the difference between those two jobs? Because I feel like a lot of people call those people perfumers, but they're not actually perfumers. No, perfumers are the ones that write the recipes for the fragrance. So if you're not doing that, then you're not a perfumer. And that you mean down to like eight of molecule A, 12 of molecule B. Exactly. Fix it with this thing. Yep. Fine tuning. Yeah. All of the, all of the ingredients. And yeah, you're working very closely hand in hand with a brand and the creative director or whoever, whatever they want to call themselves, they're the ones coming with the idea of what they want. And their jobs are very different than ours though, because they're setting the direction They're giving us inspiration. They're working with us to get to the final product, which is pretty much their vision that we have to realize for them. But then after it's done, they have to do all of the marketing and actually sell it to the public as well. Once I give it to the person, of course, I love all of my creations. So Mm. I will tell people and sell it in that way. But, you know, my job is done once I've once I've handed it off to the brands. Is that a symbiotic relation or is there tension there? Like these are two people who probably have strong feelings about scents. I find it to be very symbiotic because as I said, I'm a people pleaser. So if somebody Mm. comes to me with an idea, I just find it very stimulating to work with them to hopefully get where they want to go. If I'm left to my own devices, I would, I think I would be going a little crazy with all of the possibilities that I could be creating, you know? So to have somebody come and focus me, I really like it. It is that day, hair wash day. Honestly, sometimes when it's hair wash day, I'm just like, I don't have the time. (laughs) I don't have the energy. I just want to go to bed. I don't want to wash my hair. It's a whole to do. Guess what? You kind of don't have to. This is what I do. I use Living Proof. Their dry shampoos are amazing. When I need just a few more days out of my hair, they actually clean your hair without water. Seriously, it's totally different than any other type of dry shampoo. Living Proof is powered by MIT Science. Yes, it's hair care powered by MIT Science. And with Living Proof, you have two options to choose from. With the dry shampoo, they have their original dry shampoo formula, and that just leaves a little bit of texture and hold to your hair. Or you can go with their advanced clean dry shampoo, and that works like a shampoo and a leave-in conditioner together. And I actually prefer that. It leaves your hair really soft, shiny, and smooth, but both are great. Now, both take care of your scalp, and unlike other dry shampoos, there's no white residue behind after you use it. You apply it to your roots, but then you have to wait 30 seconds and then kind of tossle your hair after for that fresh blowout feeling. It gives you a nice, clean, healthy, shiny hair. And of course, it's PETA certified and cruelty-free, color safe and safe for chemically treated hair. Visit livingproof.com slash fat mascara and use the code fat mascara to get a free travel size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. That's livingproof.com slash fat mascara. Use the code fat mascara to get a free travel size dry shampoo. Maybe you're going away on a vacation. You don't have to pack shampoo, just pack this. You'll get a free trial size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. Visit livingproof.com slash fat mascara. Again, the code is fat mascara. Hey everyone, actress, singer, and entrepreneur Kiki Palmer has a hilarious new podcast, baby. This is Kiki Palmer on Amazon music, and you're going to want to check it out. Of course, you're going to want to check it out. Who doesn't love Kiki Palmer? She's going to be asking the burning questions that keep her up at night. But honestly, they're probably the ones that keep all of us up at night because she just has this way of talking about everything we're kind of thinking. And yet when she talks about it, it's much funnier. She's going to be talking to experts, friends, families about these kind of questions like, 
remember Tom from MySpace? Actually, what happened to him? We'll find out. Is OnlyFans only bad? How has dating changed in the digital age? And where would former child stars be if they weren't actors? She's well-versed on that one, of course. I am so excited for the podcast. I think you guys will be, too. Follow Baby, this is Kiki Palmer, wherever you get your podcasts. And Prime members, you can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. And who are these people? So tell us about some of the projects that you've worked on that you can share. I was excited to talk to you because I know you've worked with two brands who's – actually, we had the person who's that in that job you were just talking about, Symbiotic. You've worked with both Boy Smells and Otherland, two candle brands I love, as well as a bunch of fine fragrances. What are some of your favorite projects you've worked on? Boy Smells was really fun. Otherland, too, because they are willing to take risks – and so I always like that when I'm given a challenge that's something a little different and out of the ordinary. Otherland's the candle brand for people who don't know. Like, what's a risky candle? I think it's called Velvet Persimmon. Side note, the brands call them, you know, it's their, it's their baby. They call it their name. So I tend to forget what their name for these things Did are. you have a project name for it when you were working on it? Or was it just like Otherland Candle? You know, I think I forget. I forget the exact name. There was a name. There was a different name. But I can actually tell you it started from a port accord that I did at the perfumery school. And so that's one of the reasons why it's near and dear to my heart, because I've been working on it for so long and finally found it this home, taking away a little bit of that like boozy alcoholic piece and leaning into the plummy piece. So as I said, it's an accord that I loved, but nobody really understood it or thought there was a place in the market for it because it's different, but it's strong and lush and yummy. And so it just makes me so happy that, yeah, Otherland took a risk to to go with it because it's one of my favorites. So it's funny, I mentioned them, but, but, but the project you're talking about is, of course, a candle. And so I'm curious, do you approach making a fine fragrance or perfume differently than you would making a home fragrance? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. The process of development tends to be the same for any project because the client is going to come to you with an idea that they're looking for, and you're going to give them something that you think answers their their ask, and then they're going to give you a comment on it. Like, oh, we love it, but we just want it to be stronger. Okay. Oh, it's it's a nice juicy fruit, but we're actually more interested now in something vanilla or whatever it is like. And so they'll direct you and guide you and move the fragrance until either the timeline runs out or they are just in love with where you guys are. And then they finish the project. So that is absolutely the same, no matter what format you're in. The difference between, for me, between fine fragrance and candles is both like how you develop and how you evaluate because a candle, you have to burn it and smell it in the burn as well. And fine fragrance, you put on the skin and you want to smell it on skin. So it's just sort of like that evaluation stage is different. So you don't even until that late in the project, like put it into the two formats and keep testing like at at a certain point it could turn into a spray or a candle no no they tell you they tell you up front what they need so are you constantly as you're creating testing like if you know this is a candle like are you putting it in a wax base and lighting it on fire to make sure like the wax and the fire and all those other elements don't turn your lovely boozy accord into like sour grapes absolutely that is exactly okay. what we do. And so we end up, too, with a is lot Is there, like, of, a candle room? Like, where do you do this? Oh, it's not just rooms. We have we have all these candle booths, they're called. I think we have, like, 20 or something. Tell me about a candle booth. So What's a candle, the candle booth? Booths, okay, so I'll start with, for the fine fragrance, it's the easier one. When we evaluate, you have to smell on skin. And so we tell everybody you have to have clean skin to come to work. And then people will ask around for clean skin. And that's what you would do because you need like a neutral environment to test on skin. It's one and done. Once you put it on, then you're done for the day. Candles. We also have to evaluate, but we have to make sure we have the appropriate environment to evaluate them in, which are these candle booths. 
which are these like extremely vented small like they're the size of I would say my New York City bathroom or like somebody's walk-in closet in the suburbs like around that size I would say big enough to get an idea of what the candle is going to smell like in burn and then once we're done we close them up and you have to I forget what they're called but you have to exhaust them and they get vented and refreshed with air so that we can use them throughout the day. So you could be like, oh, Bob over in the on the East Wing was doing his candle in this booth and he forgot to vent. Like you walk in there and it still smells. Yes. If somebody didn't, if somebody didn't vent it. But I think that that's very rare. But you know what does happen is I have this one candle that I've been working on that is like insane. And so they always say I'm not allowed to burn it until the end of the day because they're worried that there's not enough venting time. Now, does insane mean it has a big throw? Like, yes, and it's a, a big, 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 big smell. What is a big smell to you? Like, does are they the same for other people? Or is that a very personal thing, what people will think is a big smell? Because to me, like, big is like fracas. <laughs> I don't know, like big white florals. But I, But what do you think of as big? You know, I don't think it's like any one thing, because I think it just has to do with the types of molecules you're using and then how much you're using them. So there are a lot of things that can be big. And then there are some things that you can add as much as you want, and it's never going to be that strong. Now tell me this, does that help explain, we get this question all the time from listeners, because Jess and I are both candleheads, and as are our listeners, and they're like, I bought this candle, I burnt it, You sm- it smells good in the jar, they light it up, And it's like, what happened? You can't smell anything. It has no throw. You feel like you wasted your money. Is that your fault, Dana? (laughs) Who do we blame? It's not my fault. We try our best. So I think one thing I should say is, as I said, we evaluate in these booths that are not the size of a three-story suburban house. So sometimes I think it comes down to the expectations of how big people want room these. Is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How big the room is and what people expect when they burn a candle. Does other times it come down to like they didn't put enough of your fragrance into their base? Like, Yeah, it could be that. They were scrimping on the oil and they put in 10% and it's supposed to be at 40% to smell good. I don't know. I'm making this up. No, no, no. I mean, like a candle can be anywhere from like 5 to 12%, I would say. So yeah, in a way it's up to the brand. But yeah, if you have a small candle and you expect it to fill up your whole first floor, I would say I think that it's a little unrealistic. Now, if you're buying one of those like giant three huge, wickers, yeah, oh, but not I know even it. a three wick. There are ones that are even bigger than that. Then I think okay, you can have different expectations. How many more wicks than three can you get? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's not about the number of wicks, but you haven't seen those like giant, giant candles that cost like $500 or whatever? Yes. I had one once as a gift. I got a diptyque one and we now use it. It's like a bucket. It's the size of a bucket. It's a bucket. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I do think, I don't remember how many wicks it had, but yes. Okay. That's my, that's my point. Like, I think that like you have to just have an understanding of like the size versus the space that you're burning in. But then again, we didn't talk about this, but candles have different constraints than fine fragrances. And there are certain notes that are just not going to burn very well. So like if you have a Glossier U style musky fragrance that you put it on skin and you're getting this beautiful trail and people can smell it everywhere you go, it's not going to be the same in candle. You can get like that iris piece to come out of the candle, but the musky notes are never going to burn and fill your space like you would expect a fruit or a floral type of fragrance to. Are there other besides skin musky kind of notes that just sort of just don't cut it as candles, in your opinion? Like some of the woody notes as well. Basically, these heavy molecules are not going to lift up into the air. Wait, literally, that's how it works? Like if you've got a big old molecular weight, it's just sitting down at the bottom of the floor? I mean, that's a piece of it. Yeah, they're they're heavier. Do not don't tell wanna... me that's how science works. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, it's not it's not everything. It's a little more complicated than that, but it definitely makes a difference. Yeah. Really? I don't know. My head molecules, like even if it's like large molecular weight, it's still like so teeny tiny floats around. But then obviously air has its own molecular weight. Yeah, but in comparison to like we're comparing these stronger fruity and floral notes that you do have this expectation for strength versus these heavier, like they're both molecules. You can't see them, but 
they're still in comparison. One's heavier than another. Now, does this play into when someone says, oh, on the nose, like a fine fragrance, like, you know, the citrus is on the nose and then there's the heart and the base. Do they sort of line up with those molecular weights you were just talking about or is that completely different? No, that's exactly it. That's how it works as well. Okay. So the ones that stick around that you were just saying, like the skin muskies, the deep woodsies that would be the base notes of a fine fragrance, don't lift up and light up a room. That's exactly it. It's a little more complicated because we also would have to talk about sort of how easy or difficult it is for you to perceive them in the first place. Musks, you just need more to smell it. So they're not lifting very well and you don't smell them very well. Like that combination. Is this a perfumer puzzle that it's always like, how can I get the... That's exactly Musks are it. hot right now, right? Those skin musky smells. I know. Because there are some like woods, for example, that you don't need a lot to smell it very strongly. So so that's why I say Okay, hello, woods, Santal, 33. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Some woods are easier to burn, like to get a nice smell um, in a candle than others. So yeah, that's one constraint. Then we also have... Citruses don't tend to burn well, like a lemon oil has a lot of terpenes in it, and the terpenes give off this like smoky type of note. So there are a lot of concerns. So you won't get like fresh lemon, you're getting like lemon pledge cleaner. Yes and no. Lemon pledge cleaner might burn better than an actual lemon just because some of those terpenes truly get burnt. When you, when you burn them. So we as perfumers have tricks to recreate a fresh lemon smell. So you can have a very nice fresh lemon candle, but it's not necessarily, necessarily using a lot of lemon oil itself. Oh yeah. I didn't even think about how the fireplace is. Okay. Back to the candle booth just for a second. And then I promise to be done with this candle discussion. But like, what if it's a wood wick or a, a cotton wick or a bamboo wick? Does that matter? It does. If the client is going to be using a special wick, then they would have to send it to us. I mean, so you can test in the booth with the wick. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, I had one time where they, oh, what's called over wick the candles. And they, I think they gave us their wick that was supposed to be used on a much bigger candle. And we were using it in our smaller candles. I think I forget all the details, but essentially all three of my candles lit on fire, flashed over, we call it, where the whole candle was burning and not just the wick because, yeah, because it was essentially, if the wick is too big, you're creating more heat and that raises the temperature of everything and then the whole fragrance catches on fire. So that was not an issue with my fragrance. It was just an issue with the wick that we were using. Are there fire extinguishers in the booths? Yeah. Was it like, oh, Dana, set fire to the candle booth this I actually this think week. we it was it wasn't so bad because it was just like the little candles and there's nothing yeah, it's yeah. all glass, like there's there's nothing touching anything. <laughs> there's like no whatever. There's no and, heavy drapery in the candle booth. Yeah. Obviously. And then actually the easiest way to put a fire like that out is to smother it. So we just covered it and then that was it. No fire. Keep your candle lit, people. If it gets on fire, just close it up. Yep. But obviously, by the time it gets to the store, that's not going to be happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the time it's in the store, things have been, like, (laughs) thoroughly reviewed that that will not happen. Well, we talked about musks, and I mentioned that they're trendy, but I I shouldn't say that. You you should. I want to ask you about trends. Do you think that home fragrance trends and personal fragrance trends align? Yeah, they definitely do. Typically, things start in sort of, I would say, the niche fine fragrance market, and then trickle down into more mainstream, including the home category. So like one example of this would be Tom Ford Lost Cherry. It came out about five years ago, I think. And now we see it everywhere. In home fragrance, you mean? Yeah, in home fragrance, but it's trending for brands outside of just niche fine fragrance as well. So yeah, it's definitely making its way down. That's a good example of like, a perfume, a particular perfume setting a trend and, and other brands following it. And I would probably guess that happened with Sandalwood, I guess, with the Labo like 10 years ago. But are there other times that trends come along and you're like, why is this popular right now? Like what is popular right now besides cherry? I think bold florals are coming back, sort of like the 80s. Things like orange blossom, tuberose, just those like big, big 
80s style, but I guess in more a modern way, that's kind of coming back. Like your candle that you're not allowed to burn till 5 p.m.? Yes, yes. <laughs> then, you know, gourmands have been around for a while, obviously, like people are always going to love them, but I think they're becoming a little more elevated. That's the trend we're seeing. And then given the success. What's an elevated gourmand? Can you give me an example? You know, an example would be something like a pistachio or a honey. Notes that have kind of been around, but like they're giving a a new edge to gourmands. Oh, I just saw. And I just saw Kayali, Mona Catan's fragrance. She just did a pistachio. Yeah. They, I have seen a couple pistachios. Yeah. What does pistachio go. smell like to you? How would you even describe that note? I would say yummy, creamy. You can do it in kind of a few ways. You can do like a sweet pistachio. You can do kind of a more nutty pistachio. You can lean into like the woods to give it that like texture. So yeah, it's a little bit open to interpretation, which kind of helps make it like fun and cool. Are there any notes that aren't open to interpretation? Like we all know a rose is a rose. Is yeah, a rose. I think you you nailed it. Like things that people oh, really? already, yeah, people, I mean, the rose, there's still a spectrum. You can still play, but things that people are familiar with, like I can't give a rose to somebody and say, oh, this is a pineapple. They're, <laughs> they're going to know the difference between right. those two things. But if I give a rose to somebody and say it's a Davana, you know, then yeah. maybe they'll be like, oh, OK, like they know they notice that it's a floral and maybe I can put some of those like fruity notes in and then you can kind of trick them. Right. But an amber obviously would be open to interpretation since there's so many facets and ways to like do that vibe. Right. Yeah. The amber, I would say the amber family is like one of my favorite fragrance categories. And even being a perfumer, like you would think I wouldn't need that many fragrances, but I have, you know, I'm looking at my little collection here. I have Coromandel by Chanel. I have Shalimar. I have Back to Black. I have this Amber 114 by Histoire de Parfum. Like, there are so many on the market, and people like me still buy all of them because they're just so good. Is that your favorite, your personal favorite fragrance family? Like, what you would wear when you're not at work? I think it is. One of my favorite fragrances is back to black Killian fragrance I tend to wear that do you know the perfumer who made it yes I do Kalise Becker do you know her not personally but I just met like I don't know there's not a lot of perfumers in this world I feel like there's got to be some party where you all go to and it's like oh you're wearing what Joan made and you're wearing what Kalise made and Jeeve and you know sometimes I mean in this one this case in particular so I loved Killian before I even got into the industry. And it was actually a brand that I smelled and like just had this personal connection of feeling so, I don't want to say happy, that's too like simple, but like moved, I could say. When I smelled love, that's another one that I wear. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of at this moment when I was thinking about what I was going to do. I was still a chem major. Like, was I going to go into the perfume industry? All of my friends were becoming, were going to become doctors and like go into banking and other things. And then I, I was at the perfume counter in Saks and I smelled love by Killian. And I was like, okay, this is what I have to do because this to like be able to have this type of reaction just from smelling and to yeah. give that to people I want to pursue this. Did Khalees create that scent as well? She did. And so I decided I was going to do it. And from that moment, I went to try to get a job in the industry, you know, wherever. I happened to land at Jivadon, New York, where Khalees Becker was working. And like when I saw her I, on my first day or whatever, just like, you know, she's like going to the bathroom, like her day to day. And I was so starstruck and I couldn't believe it. And then... Fast forward three years, I was at the perfumery school and she became the director of the school. So she was actually my boss and I got to work directly with her and learn from her. And I consider her a mentor to this day. So it's like crazy to me to think back to 10 plus years ago where I was to where I am now. It's kismet. Look at you. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of the amber fragrances you liked. What are 
some of your other favorite perfumes? I literally brought out my collection here so I would remember what to tell you. I love so many. As I said, I like Ambers, but my husband hates them. So I tend not to wear them around him. And in a way, thanks to him, it makes me like explore other things that I really like. I do like a lot of florals and watery fragrances. Um, So here's a little sampling. Un Jardin en Méditerranée, the Hermès fragrance. That's a favorite of mine. What does that smell like to you? You can't just say it and not tell us. Okay, sorry. It's got this like fresh bergamot top with a fig and a sandalwood, a nice musky sandalwood in the background. And it's like this, I forget, with this like watery ozonic piece threading through it. So lovely. It's one of my favorites. I love Trezor, oldie but a goodie. So I wear that sometimes from Lynn. What kind of scent is Trezor? I can like smell it in my head, but I could never describe it. So I wonder how everybody classifies it. It's funny because I read that the perfumer, who I do not know, I do not know this perfumer, but I used to live nearby her and I would, I knew which Dwayne Reed she would go into and I would always try to see if I could see her in the Dwayne Reed. (laughs) But that's another story. So I read that she was working on a rose fragrance and they kind of took it and turned it into this Trezor. So I think everybody classifies it as a floral but it's very violet it's very musky and to me it's has like a peachy note so that's that's the blend i love flower by kenzo alberto morias oh i haven't smelled that in a while i know i used to wear that i love it Um, great bottle too yeah so and then i already said back to black i love angel but don't really wear that so much why not just because it's so big and uh, as i said and it's gourmand and so my husband yeah. doesn't love it but i will indulge when i'm going out without him what about candles so do you use home fragrance or is it like don't bring your work home with you i do use home fragrance but they do tend to be it does exactly tend to be my work things that i'm either testing or liked and just want to have around So one of my favorites is this company, New Savant, that is, I've worked on a lot of their stuff. And the founder is really inspirational, I find, with her briefs. And so I think that those are probably the best example of like me. Do you know what I mean? And my tastes and... What what is one of the... Could you describe one of their candles for us? So one of my favorites is called The Dropout. It is this leather fragrance and it has a marijuana accord and it's sort of about her, her idea was this college dropout cause that's what she was, but it also definitely put me back to my college and sitting in those leather chairs with my friends. So I always tell my friends from college, like you, you have to buy this cause it's exactly like where we used to hang out. Oh my God. The smell of weed and that black couch, you know, it, it had the cushions that like flopped over. They were like fake they might have real leather. And if you lifted up those cushions, like every college dorm had this, the things you would find in those couches and they would get passed from year to year. Like everybody knows this story, yes, right? Yes, that's Why exactly Why are they all it. the same couch? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a- uh... They're very comfortable, but like, I don't want to think about ha- what happens on that couch or what is like how f- unfrequently it gets cleaned. <laughs> Yeah, I I had not thought about that. I cannot wait to buy this dropout candle and like have that moment. Because like it's a, yeah, it's That is like a piece of my life. Exactly. That is a scent memory. I do have a little bit of a quiz for you. Much easier than the first quiz I put you through when I was like making you name molecules. And you're like, oh God, this is just our Fat Mascara 5 speed round. Some quickie questions. Don't overthink it. But what's a current perfume that another perfumer worked on that really impressed you? It's it's tough. I hate to like have a cop out here, but I really admire everyone's work. So when I when I do tend to smell new things, it's like I know I know what goes into it and I'm always impressed. True. Truly, one way or another. I'm going to try to think of a good example though. Fucking fabulous by Tom Ford. That is a fragrance I really admire and not just because of the name. What's the best smelling food to you? Ooh, probably any dessert. We'll say like a cake 
or anything baked where, you know, you come in the door and you get that like fresh baked cookies or something in the air. Tell me what celebrity would you like to create a perfume for? Ooh, this is tough. I will say Billie Eilish. Ooh, fun. All right. I hear she has one or two already, but let's just put it out there in the universe. She has two. Yes, exactly. That's what it is. I'm putting it out there. Billy. if you're listening, I'm your girl. Mm-hmm. Billy. I know you're a big fat mascara fan, so hire Dana. Okay. What smell relaxes you? Probably eucalyptus. <gasps> I love the smell of eucalyptus. It's like spa. Yes. Exactly. Very relaxing. How do you describe eucalyptus? Because in my head, it's just blue-green, which is not a description. <laughs> it's like the color of the leaves. So, yeah, it's very Trendy? fresh. I don't know. Fresh. Okay. It's not minty, but I feel like if I had to describe it to an alien, you know what I mean? I would put it in yeah. that, like, minty category. Okay. But fresh is the best. Cooling, you know? Oh, yeah. That's good. That is relaxing. Okay, last question. How do you wind down at the end of the day? Truthfully... I read a lot or like Netflix, aspirationally, yoga and meditation. (laughs) I like the two-part answer. Very good. You are a people pleaser, Dana. I love it. It was so, so nice to get into your world and hear more about what you do. Thanks so much for coming on Fat Mascara. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, everyone. We are so excited to talk about our sponsor, Color Guru. You know how much we love getting our colors done, finding out our seasonal type. Jess and I have both done Color Guru's analysis. And now we have some good news. You are going to be eligible for your own free color guru analysis. So when you get a color guru analysis, a color guru will analyze your hair, skin, and eye color and match you with your perfect color palette for clothing. Your color guru will give you a 15-page color radiance report plus a digital color card for your phone, so handy, and a laminated color card for your purse. P.S. I also hang mine in my closet. I have my color guru card at my desk so I can refer (sighs) to it. So handy for online shopping. Simply match the clothes in the store to the colors on your card and feel confident that you're choosing a perfect color for you. Okay, does that sound amazing? I know it does. Are you ready? Five Fat Mascara listeners are going to win a free color guru analysis. Here's how you enter. Go over to Instagram, follow Fat Mascara, and follow Color Guru. They're at Your Color Guru at Your Color Guru. Follow us both. We will have an Instagram post there all about the giveaway. You comment on it. All you have to do is comment what you think your seasonal type is. Are you right? Are you wrong? You won't know until you win. And five of you will. You're going to win a free Color Guru analysis, $165 value. Again, just go over to Instagram, follow Fat Mascara and Your Color Guru. Leave a comment on the giveaway post for your chance to win. It is that day, hair wash day. Honestly, sometimes when it's hair wash day, I'm just like, I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I just want to go to bed. I don't want to wash my hair. It's a whole to do. Guess what? You kind of don't have to. This is what I do. I use Living Proof. Their dry shampoos are amazing. When I need just a few more days out of my hair, they actually clean your hair without water. Seriously, it's totally different than any other type of dry shampoo. Living Proof is powered by MIT Science. Yes, it's hair care powered by MIT Science. And with Living Proof, you have two options to choose from. With the dry shampoo, they have their original dry shampoo formula, and that just leaves a little bit of texture and hold to your hair. Or you can go with their advanced clean dry shampoo, and that works like a shampoo and a leave-in conditioner together. And I actually prefer that. It leaves your hair really soft, shiny, and smooth, but both are great. Now, both take care of your scalp, and unlike other dry shampoos, there's no white residue behind after you use it. You apply it to your roots, but then you have to wait 30 seconds and then kind of tossle your hair after for that fresh blowout feeling. Gives you a nice, clean, 
healthy, shiny hair. And of course, it's PETA certified and cruelty-free, color safe and safe for chemically treated hair. Visit livingproof.com slash fat mascara and use the code fat mascara to get a free travel size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. That's livingproof.com slash fat mascara. Use the code fat mascara to get a free travel size dry shampoo. Maybe you're going away on a vacation. You don't have to pack shampoo, just pack this. You'll get a free trial size dry shampoo with your purchase of $45 or more. Visit livingproof.com slash fat mascara. Again, the code is fat mascara.